With the Boondocks set to return in fall of 2020, something that's caught the eye of many diehard fans of the series is the current visual direction. Much less a statement on how it looks as that truly remains to be seen, but more to overt strides in straying away from the design of the original series. This is a given, because you know, it's a, it's a reboot. It's only really natural that in order to reinvent the Boonox for a new audience, it comes with the baggage and, dare I say, opportunity to rethink how the Boonox looks. Anyone arguing that the original show looked perfect would be lying to you. That said, there's evidently been a lot of thought put into it. This video isn't intended to criticise the current visual direction of the Boonox reboot. It's a study on the Boonox's design influences, and how it's ultimately gone on to shape the look of the franchise. I think there's a fascinating level of both consistency and evolution in the Boonox's style, and I figured it'd be interesting to share that with people interested in design. Exactly how and why the Boonox looks, animates, and I... <laughs> I guess, I guess fights? <laughs> oh man, there's a, there's a lot of fights. And generally operates the way it does in terms of art. Without wasting time, let's get into it. Whoa, 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 let's not start right here. To start this video, I figured it'd be important for people to understand the art and the arts behind the Boonox and how, how it informed the visual direction. The Boonox comic strip started in 1999 on the Hitlers.com, and one of the biggest things you'll notice looking at the original comic strips compared to the syndication is the art style. The heads look chubbier, the mouths look more pronounced, and most importantly, the detail. Some of this would eventually be lost in syndication because of how time consuming the job of a cartoonist is, but there's a lot of detail here. Two key things defining the Boonox art style at this point. The iconic eagle eyebrows that would go on to be a staple of the series, and this free level shading of the face and or hair. This is an element even in the Boonox pilot, there's an almost excessive amount of detail put into the hair. This is relevant because it's going to be important for something I'll talk about later. Looking at Aaron's influences for the style of the comic strip, something I immediately noticed is a strong resemblance to the Peanuts and Doomsbury. This extends beyond the concept of references and even some set pieces. They're directly drawn from other strips. Aaron has vocalized how inspired he was by the Peanuts special several times. To do the daily strip and a weekly show, I thought that would be too much. Crazy me. I wanted to do like specials, like, like you know, like the Peanuts specials. Two, three a year. I or, or, or one a year. I go, oh, that sounds like a nice... The television apparently doesn't work that way anymore. I was going to ask you who your favorite comic strip artist of all time is. Bill, Water mentioned... Bill Watterson. Bill Watterson. Oh, me too. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you know, there's, there's Charles Schultz. But the reality is that, that, you know, the Peanuts actually just transcended the medium. It just became so much more than that. And, you know, Charles Schultz's legacy is in, is in more than his comic strip. It's actually in the TV shows, which I, I really like, this, the little Christmas special and all that stuff. I mean, but in, in terms of who I felt was, is the best cartoonist day in and day out, it's Bill Watterson. There's even some panels of a strip that clearly draw influence from Bill Watterson's style. But on the other side of things, the two significant anime on the eastern side of things that helped shape the visual style would be Akira and Speed Racer. They're both iconic anime which very likely had a heavy influence on the way the Boonox characters looked. You know, just like Peanuts and Doomsbury, there were very clear references. Caesar's original design features a red big wheel, and Hiro Otomo is a reference to the mangaka behind Akira. We could even get more intertextual with the subtext of Akira being about revolution, but the general gist is the Boonox is a hybrid of Eastern and Western animation that prides itself on striking visuals to capture an audience. Anime was obviously a big influence. Anime is really just Japanese animation directors imitating American cinema, so it all ties together in a sense. The primary reason Aaron decided to go for this style was because, according to him, he knew that was how he eventually wanted it to be animated. Aaron would eventually give up drawing the strip and hand over the reins to Jennifer Sang. Jennifer Sang is a talented Boston-based artist who worked on the comic strip between 2003 and 2004. Most of her artwork will be featured in the book Public Enemy No. 2. A big facet of Jennifer's style is that the proportions were eventually evened out. A big criticism I have of Aaron's style is that sometimes it just kinda kinda feels like a big old head on a small body. Jennifer managed to make things feel more balanced and human. And while I have a fondness for Aaron's early stuff, the characters feel a lot more alive this time. And I think another big factor into this is that, you know, reading the strips, Jennifer real she, she rarely cuts corners. Like at some point in 2002, I'm convinced half the comic strips were either Huey staring at the TV or the same profile show of him and Caesar. So this this visually anyway, this was this was a really nice change of pace. For the most part, everything is its own drawing and it's been boarded really well. Again, I understand that doing daily syndicated cartoon strips isn't, it, it really isn't easy. It's isolating and it's really demanding. But considering the quick turnaround time and just how topical the Boonox comic strip was, it's honestly really impressive what Jennifer was able to do with the small time frame she had. I had an opportunity to speak with her briefly about it and ask about adapting the original designs. One thing I can point out for sure is the hands. I have a very specific style on how I draw hands, and that was one thing that had to be shaved down a little to look closer to the Boonox style versus my own. 
Now that we're on the topic of hands, I figured it'd be important to cite another one of the Boonox's key influencers, Capcom. Now you're probably trying to process the correlation, but you know, just, uh, just hear me out, give me one second. I'm not particularly sure when this started, but the Boonox for the longest time has had a very strong influence from the Capcom aesthetic. We spoke with David Corman, an eyes behind the Boonox pilot, and he confirmed this. Aaron, for whatever reason, really wanted a Capcom look. The Boonox pilot was worked on fall of 2003 to summer of 2004. So it's very likely the same ideas were applied. Am I saying that Huey and Riley are supposed to look like Mega Man and Bass? I mean, that's not even, not even inaccurate. Give me one sec. A key component of the Capcom style are these oversized hands and feet. This general enlargement of features, and we're gonna get a lot into this when we start talking about the video game, but the Boonox Capcom influence was something that had its roots back from even 2003. And it all really started with this rounding out of the proportions and slight enlargement of specific features. Around late 2004 to the end of 2006, Carl Jones took over for the artwork for the comic strip. And while I don't think the art is drafted as well as, you know, Jennifer's, likely due to time constraints, the biggest thing to note is how much the style draws from the show. It started as a slight imitation of Jennifer's work, but it really evolved into this, this imitation of the show. In fact, you can look at the design documents and you can see direct similarities to the show's design sheets and Carl's artwork. Which also kind of means this is, this is the closest we're ever going to get to seeing what Caesar would have looked like in the show, which is sad for multiple reasons, but you know what I mean. <laughs> the artwork was okay and it was really good for the time constraints. It created a level of consistency between the strip and the show. Heading into the show, it's common knowledge that the inspiration for the show's art style eventually were Cowboy Bebop, Samurai Champloo, and Fooly Cooly. There's a lot of people and companies that went into the Boonox's design, so if I went into all of them, I'd generally be here all day. But I'll try to stress the really, really important ones. LaShawn Thomas and Sun Kim. LaShawn Thomas is known for his work on Ben 10, Black Dynamite, a bunch of other shows. Even more recently, you know, Cannon Busters on Netflix, so you know, shout out to him. Him and Carl Jones really helped define the look of seasons 1 and 2. Carl Jones did bits on Bob's, he's a talented artist who obviously worked on the comic strip. He also did a lot of promotional material for the Boondocks. A lot of the iconic Boondock shots and iconography you see was probably done by Carl Jones. LaShawn Thomas worked more hands on in the character design and co directorial department, in the first two seasons anyway. Some of the characters in the show are literally based on members of the staff too. And while LaShawn was a big factor into the look of season 2, when you think about the Boonox's show's style, it's very difficult to think of anyone but Sung Kim. Sung Kim is an animal and I'm sure Aaron realized this. Yeah, this was done by Sung Kim. Amazing. Sung Kim, um, who, uh, who is uh, uh, also on our, our team, uh, and I, I think just one of the best illustrators alive, um, wow. made, made this happen. Well, how, how could you say that in front of hey, me? Hey, come on, hey, how could you say hey. that? This guy, like, I'm not, I'm not gonna say everything he did. Aaron was the showrunner, so like obviously he had the he had the final say on everything creative, obviously. But I mean, this guy directed almost every episode. Like it's kind of nuts. Expressions, storyboards, designs, references. This guy, this guy's kind of insane at what he does. I think he's one of the biggest factors into why the Boonox can so seamlessly look like Eastern animation in the first place. You know that fight scene with the blind nigga samurai? He did that. You know those crazy shots of Huey and the Red Bull? He did that. Sung has a very distinct, almost aggressive visual style. And purely from an artistic standpoint, the work he's done both on and off the Boondocks has really shaped the franchise. It's consistent with this one trend the Boondocks has followed since its inception. Striking visuals that capture an audience. However, in doing this, I think, I think it limits itself and pertains to another element. I have to get into that studio, even if it means going through you. Man, you come straight out of a comic strip. I dreamt of a blind sword. You better fall back, nigga. You can't beat me! I'm Butch Magnus! Yeah, you feel good when you come out of nowhere and suck a bunch of niggas. Why don't you fight a nigga straight up? Animation is a very complicated process that involves many hands and eyes painstakingly drawing things frame by frame to get the right movement. It's in-between, it's timing, it's staying on model. Something the Boonox seems to prioritize heavily is staying on model. I'll get into this a bit when I talk about the Boonox's designs, but because of this, the Boonox strays away from wild visuals or experimenting with different styles. I'll explain. One of the anime the Boonox took influence from was Fooly Cooly, but from all the animes that the Boonox took influence from, Fooly Cooly seems to have the least impact on the way the Boonox looks. Fooly Cooly does a lot to exaggerate expressions and reactions through its animation, from heads popping off to loosening the art style to emphasize comedic moments. The Boonox doesn't I mean, it doesn't really do this. <laughs> it really don't. High quality artwork is the priority. So even if a fight scene is intended to be comedic, it remains mostly on model for the sake of visual consistency. It doesn't have to be this way. Shows that take influence from Fully Cooly, for instance, are Avatar The Last Airbender and Teen Titans. You can see it. You can just see it. It isn't difficult to spot when the show takes a more cartoony look in order to emphasize a joke. Both shows are Western cartoons that take influence from the Eastern style. The Boonox strays away from this. 
And while it does result in a show that looks visually consistent, it rarely attempts to do something unconventional with the genre. It wants to look pretty at all times. This was one of Aaron's biggest complaints in season 2. Outside just wanting to make the show funnier, they wanted the show to look good. This is also partially why the wait for season 2 took so long. While I'd argue the storyboards for season 1 tend to be really good, I can't say the same for the art for some of the episodes. Guess who's coming to dinner sticks to mind really hard with this. Huey and Riley look really ugly at some points. There's other moments like this too, like characters' eyes, outfit changes. Season 1 has a lot of errors, because for the most part, you know, they, they were flying blind. But with this in mind, I think this strict desire to stay pretty and be a model at all times can be really limiting. Not only in illustrating the different styles of animators, but it can also make the show look really stiff and blend a lot of scenes together. I'm talking outside the context of a fight scene here. Before I go on, it's important for the average viewer that prefixes the difference between artwork and animation. This is art. This is animation. Stack frames with moving mouths isn't very indicative of strong animation. The Boonox isn't a very kinetic show. And you know, this, is, this isn't an insult either, because it's a very dialogue heavy show, so it, it makes sense. I'm not expecting Riley to do the splits every time he makes a joke. But it's something important to bear in mind. I think the best example I can give of this is every time a character dances in the boondocks. Like, what's, what's Riley doing? He looks like he's lagging. Nigga ain't doing the homie, he's doing the dialogue. I mean, you, you might know anybody who danced like this. That's probably why Huey went upstairs. He didn't want his frame rate to drop. You know, you see, you know I'm joking, but it's a real thing. Now, some of this is communicated in the storyboard, but I think a lot of it has to do with how the Boonox is sent off to be animated. At that point, it's really out of the team's hands. And that's most shows. It's partially why I don't understand this culture of defining what an anime is. Anime just means cartoon, and cartoons from The Simpsons to Teen Titans to The Boondocks, they're all, they're all shipped off to different countries and studios for animation. In terms of the process, there's no difference between a cartoon and an anime, because the process generally is the exact same. It's just done in different styles, and that style isn't exclusive to any specific region. But with that said, I think the lack of communication when it comes to the animatics being sent off to being animated results in situations like this. Things not looking the way they're supposed to, because there's a limit to the extent to which the show can communicate what it wants. Yeah, we, we um, this was originally supposed to be a, a Star Wars sequence, and um, right. it didn't come back like we had hoped. Um, but we were going to open on a big Star Wars open, and Lucas had signed off on it. It was very cool, and then the animation didn't come back right. Uh. It's fascinating because there's moments where the team has to act out things like they want. Like the second Gangster Lissus episode. The dance was a key part of the episode, and if they go it wrong, they would have been doing the dial-up the whole way through. And you know, a lot of movies and shows do stuff like this as references tend to be used in animation a lot to authentically capture emotion and a movement. Or, I guess in this case, uh, <laughs> uh, gay rappers. <laughs> but for the limitations, I think the Boonlocks works around this quite well. It focuses its efforts on strong storyboards, clean artwork, and something else I'll get into later. But the two shows the Boonlocks drew the most influence from were Samurai Temple and Cowboy Bebop. And I think it's easier to see what the team drew influence from. The scenes directly referencing the Cowboy Bebop movie several times within the show. From Huey's confrontation with Stingmina to him breaking the sweeper and using it as a staff. There's a lot of parallels made between Huey and Spike Spiegel. I, I don't know, but I'm guessing, I'm guessing being heavily influenced by Bruce Lee tends to do that. <laughs> I think the Boonlocks borrow from Bebop how it frames its sequences, but, but for the most part, the style of the show borrows more from Champaloo. And it doesn't really surprise me it sparked an interest in the team, considering it was an anime with a hip-hop soundtrack about samurais. I can make a whole video about the parallels between hip hop culture and samurais, from artists like Wu Tang, this idea of honor, and so on and so forth. In fact, I think, I think I might have already done it. To list everything the Boonocks draws on Champaloo would take too long, but to give some examples, the season 1 opening animation, some of the fight scenes, and most importantly, I think the humor. Samurai Champaloo is a very humorous show which does a lot with facial expressions and the like. I can see some of this was the stuff they do with Grandad. Huey's limited in pertains to how much he can emote due to the rules regulating that you can't smile, which I mean, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with. I, I, <laughs> I don't know why anybody would break this rule out of a, a sheer sense of morbid curiosity. So the show tends to be more experimental with the other characters. It doesn't happen all the time as the Moonox show tends to prefer characters to stay grounded, but it sporadically shows up when there's a need for visual humour and I think it overall works. I can even see the resemblance between a character like Fu and Jasmine's character design, as originally Jasmine didn't have lashes under her eyes, but I'm guessing we're added in order to fit with the style of Champloo, which bleeds nicely into the next thing I want to discuss. <laughs> Character design is an often overlooked element of this series I want to talk about briefly. Because the Boonox has gone through so many various design changes throughout the years, I want to talk about it a bit. Strong character designs tend to follow these general ideas. They need to be simple to understand, recognisable, have an established style, and lastly, communicate something about the character through its design. 
Thankfully characters like Huey and Jasmine already have to see the wet value. Huey has this really big afro and Jasmine has her crazy hair. However, Riley had to be redesigned with cornrows in order to accommodate this though. Because before, he basically just looked like Huey with shorter hair. There's a saga in the strips that make a joke about this, but Huey and Riley look the exact same. Remove the hair and, you know, they basically have the exact same face. <laughs> and that's fine, they're brothers, you know, that's, that's kind of the point. But Riley needed something to distinguish himself from Huey. And it seems even from the pilot, this is where they were going. I don't think it's a coincidence that there was an attempt to cover up Riley's head a lot, because ultimately it was, uh, I mean, it was a bit uninteresting. And in the pilot, it just looks fucking weird. <laughs> but all of this helped in giving the character silhouette value, and they really took advantage of it. Outside the hair, Riley remains mostly consistent with his outfits. The white vest and blue jeans were always kind of a thing. It was kind of a big thing in hip hop for a while. The Timbs helped bring it back to New York, and they kind of made an effort to oversize his clothing to overemphasize this. Huey's a more interesting study because his inherent concept limits how visually appealing he can look. Huey's a product of the intellectual age of hip hop, and while I'll get into this another day, he's essentially supposed to harken back to the 1960s Black Panther Party. It's why he wears a black turtleneck and rocks an afro, but this inherently limits the way in which he can design Huey, and by extension, make him modern. And if I were to assume, that's always kind of been the biggest struggle with Huey. How do you modernize him without compromising what makes the character who he is? Like it doesn't surprise me that Huey stopped wearing all of his outfits from season 1. I don't think all of them were bad, I, like, you know, I, I quite like the Fidel Castro outfit. But stuff like The Real, like man, I, I love this episode, but looking at Huey in a green jumper, black scarf and pink pants, man, man, when I say no drip, that's why the White Shadow showed up, he wanted Huey to buy some new clothes. And I think Huey's the most difficult character to design in the series because of this. There's restrictions on how he should remote, what he can wear, and just generally, just generally there's a lot more to be mindful of when designing this character. But I think it's good and shows a level of integrity and respect to the character. It's why Huey almost feels completely redesigned in season 2 to accommodate this. Huey's outfits feel like a natural extension of his conservative touch to fashion, while still retaining hallmarks of his personality. A personal favour of mine being the militant Red Star jacket. Jasmine's an easy character to design I feel because she's mostly a conventional child. Her design is something more along the lines of what would an actual 10 year old girl wear? Cause you know that's kind of the idea of a character. Grandad's outfit never really changed throughout the years. He's got a nice red shirt, a white tee, but that's and that's basically it. He wears suits on dates and a speedo on interesting nights. So that's uh that's about it. Now I'm gonna talk a bit about proportions and its relation to the Capcom thing I talked about earlier. The best example I can give for this is ironically fully coolie. I want you to look at Nauta's hands. Now I want you to look at Huey's. The Boonox has always had this Capcom touch with these oversized hands and feet to make the characters feel more recognizable. It's why when you see a silhouette of Huey or Riley, you can immediately tell who they are. Not just because of their hair, but their proportions. A key part of character design is making it easy to recognize shapes for the audience to see. And I don't think this was ever made more present than the designs for the video game. These designs, to me anyway, are near perfection. Huey's hoodie speaks to his political affiliation, his bottom half communicating that he's militant in a pose that screams that he's ready, Riley's pose communicating the same thing but also that he doesn't care, his design is familiar but boasts a lot of subtle changes that I think work to bring out his personality, from the black gloves to the bandana to even the slingshot. Like generally there's just, there's a lot more communicated about these characters through these designs which doesn't really feel like it flies in the face of the original intent. Even Grandad's outfit feels like something he just threw together at the last minute and that's exactly why it works. And feeding into that Capcom point again, I get serious Mega Man Battle Network vibes from seeing the size of their hands, to even the posing. The eyes are larger, making room for more expression for the kids, but don't compromise the iconic eagle eyebrows. There's just a lot here that's just working as an extension of what these characters are and what the game was designed to be. It's really a shame that we never got to see what this game would have looked like. But as I've communicated before, the Violet theme seems to have been translated into what eventually became the Boonox reboot. It was important for me to go through the Boondocks' design history to give people an idea of what the design process was like for the Boondocks, but also to give my general perspective on how the Boondocks is designed as a whole. So what have we established? The Boondocks has always prioritised quality art and visual consistency, regardless of what it's attempting to do. There's a lot of mandates on the character of Huey because he's a complicated character. The Boonox has a strong influence on the Capcom aesthetic. Its style is defined by exaggerated proportions and somewhat aggressive eagle eyebrows that the series is known for. Modernising concepts that are derivative of certain eras of hip-hop has always been a difficult task. And lastly, the Boonox wants engaging fight sequences that draw from the staging of bebop and the fluidity of Samurai Champloo. I'm not a member of the Boonox team, but following the design principles of the series from 96 to modern day, you know, I think, I think, I think that's the general correlation. I'm prefacing all my comments about the Boonox reboot's designs with the fact that we don't know how this is going to look in movement. As of this moment, we don't even have a trailer. So for all intents and purposes, everything I'm about to say is hot air. Alright, uh, cool. <clears throat> With that said, We have been hoodwinked, bam!
bamboozled, led astray, run amok, and flat out deceived. See, I'm joking. I see, I'm joking. Don't don't take this stuff too seriously. There's a bunch of stuff they've shown off that I quite like, and I think shows some real promise. But in the same breath, there's other stuff that makes me question the direction and design decisions. Before I start, I want to make it clear that if your immediate response to this is going to be something along the lines of "just be grateful the Boonox is back," this is Aaron's vision. Shut the fuck up. Then you should probably just click off. There seems to be a culture surrounding Aaron Rugudo and his work that creates a narrative that ducks criticism of the material he curates. Let's keep it real, this is just dick riding. Something Aaron's historically quite vocal about disliking. I think a big part of this has to do with the situation surrounding season 4. And while I have complicated opinions on that, which I'll get into another day, I want to make it clear that all of that, I mean, it, does, it really doesn't matter to me. It's undeniable to say the Boonox and Aaron haven't had an impact on me. A lot of this channel is partially dedicated to expressing that, but that doesn't really mean for a second that I'm interested in mindlessly consuming whatever the Boonox puts out. If anything, the Boonox show makes several points against this sort of mindset. There's episodes of the show I don't like, there's parts of the strip that I'm glad were left behind. I don't like Black Jesus season 3, couldn't even finish it, but it doesn't take away from my love of the material, nor does it affect the impact the creator or the work has had on me as an individual. Not everything is an attack. Life doesn't work in this binary, you with us or against us crap. Like this, this ain't a gang, I'm just gonna speak honestly. I'm gonna start with the positive. I think something the Boonox comics have demonstrated masterfully is how the Boonox can evolve as a stick into something wacky and cartoony. Look at Huey's expressions here, it's incredible. And I haven't really seen anything like it done officially with these characters. Similarly, let's look at this design. Say what you want about how far it strays from what we recognize the Boonox as, it is 110% Capcom. And in that sense, it sticks to the Boonox's design philosophy incredibly well. Some of these expressions are really good. I've never seen these characters be this emotive, basically ever. <laughs> you want me to be? You want me to keep it real? There's a lot of promise here, and I have no doubt in my mind that this show is gonna look good. And I'm familiar with the work of several of the artists they've shown off. Like, don't get it twisted. These are some really talented people. But you know, as with anything, there's small things that are making me raise a bit of an eyebrow. For starters, the excessive amount of clothing. This is specifically and pertains to Huey and Jasmine's designs. This is a common problem with reboots where attempts to reinvent the characters results in slapping a bunch of extra stuff on them, which overall just serves to distract from the simplicity of their appeal. It's not the best example, but you know, it's, a, it's the first thing that comes to mind. Think Sonic Boom, a reboot of the franchise where they didn't know what to do to reinvent these characters. Then they realized drastic alterations would remove from their iconography in the first place. And you know what happened? They just slapped some sports tape over them instead. It looks tacky. Why have this when you could have this? This also feeds into another point in regards to animation. When the base model is too detailed, animators can often struggle to animate the material. So what often ends up happening is that scenes are quite often drawn slightly off model to accommodate this. If you've been listening, you know the Boonox doesn't do this. The Boonox prioritizes quality art and animation. This is something that shows like Bebop and Champloo did quite often. In fact, it's also why their designs are quite simple. It's loose and simplistic because it allows for animators to create fluid animation. Like how, even if we're to look at the original Boonox show, but it has relatively simple designs, I would imagine because of this. This, I mean, none of this is simple. Huey has beads, Jasmine's wearing everything under the sun, and Ruckus is looking kinda nuts. I question if modernizing Huey's design contradicts some elements of his personality. Huey looks like a bit of a hype beast here. Does he look cool? You know what, yeah. You know, this isn't exactly what I'd call conservative fashion. And while I do appreciate how much this design commits to the Capcom aesthetic, I think the eyes and outfit don't do a good job at communicating the character or the other Boonox design principles. I'm not sure if this is intentional or not, but I also quite like that it's similar to Nauta. <laughs> that said, I want to make it clear that this doesn't mean anything, because once again, this is a reboot. It has no real obligation to adhere to old design principles. I imagine, you know, if anything, it benefits from differentiating itself. It gives it its own visual identity. Despite my criticisms, I want to make it clear that I do think there's a lot of promise here. I love a lot of the elements on display here. I like seeing more of these big old Capcom hands. I love how dynamic some of these poses are. Look at this shit, it's incredible. I voice concern because I love this series and I want it to be the best it can be. I'm not deluded enough to imply that that means following what I believe this series needs to be designed as, but it's impossible for me to not have preferences with knowledge of what this series once was. Let's keep it real, a lot of faces and names have come and gone. It's, n it's naturally not going to be the same. Something that always stuck out to me is something Aaron said in the now defunct Facebook post about the video game. I know a lot of fans who missed the show, and even more OG fans who probably hated the show and missed the comic strip. The sustained relevance of the characters to the generation who grew up with them has been heartening to see. It won't be for every fan of the show, or the comic strip, but it will be equally sincere, but still a bizarre political satire that's largely about race and inappropriate for children. Now, I'm going to quickly compare this statement to something Aaron wrote in 97. This was on the old Hitler site, so you know, humble beginnings. 
This is only an excerpt, but give it a listen. The Boonox is satire and silliness, drama and politics, and hip hop. It's a mature look at the world and at ourselves through the innocent, but nonetheless astute eyes of the young cast. It's an opportunity to express myself through a medium that's taught me so much, to which I'm forever thankful. It's a depiction of black youth simply as likeable kids, without deracializing them or avoiding politically charged topics. Finally, it's a reminder of how cute we all were when we were young. I believe the Boonox's biggest strength and biggest weakness are one and the same. The Boonox is really topical, and it's constantly reinventing itself, constantly redefining itself for a new generation. And with that, things are lost with time. But the ever constant of the Boonox largely being about race, politics, and inappropriate for children remains mostly true. And so long as the Boonox never forgets its roots and knows the direction it's walking in, then I think it has nowhere to go but up.